Now this is gonna be an interesting video because it seems as though every two to three months somebody brings up the topic and this time it's Shaq doing us the honors. Ten years ago, the WNBA game was here. NBA game is here. Now it's here. I have a way to make it equal. Just listen to me now. You ready? All right. We've heard it. Yeah, we've, we've. So in beach volleyball, the women's net is maybe half an inch lower. Ah! <laughs> I know you feel the cringe, man. I'm dying of cringe. The awkward tension in the air is killing me. I know she's cringing, and these two are just begging for him to stop. But here they put on their smiles because Shaq goes on for an additional 20 seconds. You think if we just lower the rim so y'all could dunk like we dunk, that'll give y'all more oomph than you already have? No. I mean, because listen, y'all are doing the, the step back, the pull back. Y'all doing everything we're doing, but... I don't see a lot of people going up with two hands and, you know, back. Oh, it's down. coming. Opportunity is a... So you don't think if we just is a, drop it to nine, ten nah, and a half? I'm, I, I guarantee Layla, she's into dance, but my next child will be drop step Duncan. I promise. <laughs> I'm still thinking about... All right. Well, I guess we have to wait 20 years for that daughter then. Hey, Shaq is tiptoeing around what I think I'm calling now the WNBA problem. The problem is as goes. Last year, the WNBA reportedly made $60 million in revenue. Pretty good. But but it lost $72 million. So technically negative. Not technically, in all aspects is negative. And Shaq here is just trying to tackle the WNBA problem in the most awkward way imaginable. Uh, so maybe, hopefully, after watching this video, we never had to experience somebody on TV creating just the wow, the what, woo. I don't want to experience that again. I don't think y'all do neither, so pay attention. The WNBA problem is a problem that we all known to be the case for a very long time, and it's one Adam Silver himself has been pretty vocal about. I'm particularly frustrated that we've been unable to get young women, girls to attend those games. It's interesting, women's basketball is largely supported just in terms of demographics by older men, for whatever reason, who like fundamental basketball. We're not connecting with almost the same demographic that our players are. Well, Adam Silver's asking a good question. Why are the people that support the WNBA old white men and not the type of people that are playing in the WNBA? Well, that's not a question for me to answer because if Adam Silver himself doesn't have the answer, who the f am I to have such an answer? But it is a question worth asking. And I find it very, very interesting that the second anybody, regardless of who it is, brings up a concern like this, the conversation is immediately twisted into this direction. What can we do? How can we get these women a bigger chunk of that pie and get them paid? By growing the business. And Adam Silver really doesn't have to say much more than that because you can't ask for a bigger pie of a business that's already in the red. It needs to start making some money. Now for context, there are plenty of businesses that are quote unquote successful but lose money every single day. I'd argue Netflix is one of them. But there are other businesses like Snapchat or Uber or Postmates or DoorDash where we actually don't know when they'll ever be profitable if ever. So it isn't technically the end of the world that a league as new as the WNBA is losing so much money every single year. But again, there's questions that have to be answered so that you could eventually get to the point of profitability. And derailing the conversation from how is the business gonna make money to why aren't the people in the business being paid more is crazy. Especially when the average salary in the WNBA, if you look here, is over $100,000 in a failing business. Now I use the word failing lightly because I don't don't think it's failing. I think for all intents and purposes, the WNBA is a win for the NBA. I mean, just looking at this quick little bar graph here shows you that 42% of the people that watch the NBA are women. So having a league exclusive to women could pay big dividends if the NBA can get people to care about it. The numbers that have been reported though are, uh, well, they were reported by the NBA and they were reported at a time where the WNBA just left a collective bargaining agreement in 2019. And so it was in the owner's best interest to downplay the type of money that WNBA athletes were creating for the league so that they can keep a bigger share of the money. Now, that's just me being skeptical. That being said, WNBA doesn't look like it's highly profitable. And personally me, I trust the numbers Adam Silver is giving in this instance. So I'm gonna break this video up into three different segments. One, what the market is saying. Two, what the WNBA players are saying. And then three, why people are making comparisons to the NBA. Because although I'm not gonna do it the way that Shaq did it, it is a question 
question worth asking. How do you get people to watch the WNBA? How do you get the WNBA to make more money? Now, these numbers are reported by WSN. The WNBA makes 60 million in revenue. And even though they only charge an average of $17 per ticket, I'd argue getting 6,700 people to show up to any event is impressive. And it's not all negative. There's growth in the WNBA. And that's something positive to look forward to. This article here was titled Viewership of the 2020 WNBA Finals is up 15% from 2019. And so in a period where we're actually seeing a decline in the NBA, we're seeing a slight incline in the productivity from WNBA viewership. So there we go. There's something positive to look forward to. But then I immediately get a lot more pessimistic about the future of the WNBA because it's true, the NBA is pushing it a lot. I mean, in between the middle of NBA games, you'll see promotion for WNBA games. You'll see it on the signage that's around the courts. You'll see it in the commercial breaks as well. You'll see it in NBA 2K, 2K League, G League, and all of the NBA affiliates. The NBA and all of its arms and legs that's connected to it is like a promotional machine. And because the NBA is the biggest, everything connected to it stands to benefit. And that means in terms of revenue as well. So if I'm LifeWater and I'm owned by PepsiCo and I reach out to the NBA, the NBA will come to me and be like, yeah, we'll charge you $12 million and 8 million of that's gonna go to the NBA, but I also want 1 million of that to go to the NBA 2K League, 2 million to go to the G League, and 1 million to go to the WNBA. And so just by being affiliated by the NBA, the WNBA makes money. It's an arm for the W. Honestly, I do that with my channels as well. Since I'm across five channels on YouTube, when I'm talking to a sponsor, they'll be like, do you wanna do one promo on your main channel? A tweet, three Instagram story posts, a TikTok, and a second second channel promotion as well. That's just how businesses prefer to do business. It's easier to sell in bulk than it is to sell individually. So in that sense, you could argue that the revenue that is created by the WNBA is largely supported by the NBA, not fans of the WNBA. But we really don't know what that $60 million includes. Whether it includes those group sales or it doesn't, we don't know. Okay, so that's what the market is saying, that there's hope, but there's no real evidence right now that the WNBA is, is heading to a very positive trajectory. Although, like, I'd argue in business, there's no real way to know for certain what's going to happen at any time, but the fact that it's at least treading upwards slightly is a good sign. Regardless of how it's being held up, whether it's the NBA doing it or it's market forces, it really doesn't matter if it's trending upwards. Hopefully you can build on that momentum. So, okay, so that's what the market is saying. Let's talk about what some WNBA players are saying and why I feel like it's harmful to the overall goal of the WNBA. I think one, people don't really ever mention it, but the NBA harbors a lot of, and believe it or not, businesses put money on this, goodwill. I guarantee you that is a, you could put a money number on the type of goodwill you've built when you have a exclusively women league that NBA players and the NBA as a whole is actively supporting. Women see that and they feel a lot more likely to support the NBA as well as hopefully the WNBA at some point. I feel like no one ever mentions goodwill, but I, f I think it's really important to uh, your the type of association you make with a business. I've been to restaurants where I felt like the service was so great and it was so homey and they were so cool that I like I went there just because of that even if I felt like the next place had better food and that goodwill is important because as I'm gonna mention a little bit later it's kind of difficult to come up with a grand appeal for what makes the WNBA a riveting event to watch as a product okay so quickly let's talk about what Shaq said Shaq said lower the net maybe just a little bit so that you guys can dunk so maybe it's more entertaining and maybe if it's more entertaining more people will watch and then there was gonna be more money made. Maybe. Well, it's not a crazy idea because the WNBA already has a lot of concessions. A WNBA basketball is an inch smaller and two ounces lighter than a regulation NBA basketball. There are four quarters in the NBA and the WNBA, but in the NBA, each quarter is 12 minutes. In the WNBA, it's 10. An NBA roster can have anywhere from 12 to 15 players, but a WNBA roster can only have 12 players. To be eligible to be in the WNBA, you must be 22 years old, and as of right now, in the NBA, you just have to be 19 with one year of college in you. And then hopefully soon it's gonna be 18 like how it was back in the day. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. People seem to put some kind of negative spin on why are you making the game easier for women? But Shaq is right, they do it in volleyball, but they also do it in college sports. The college three-point line is significantly closer than the NBA three-point line. I'd argue college athletes are some of the best athletes on the planet, wouldn't you? 
But still, there is that difference. And once you reach that highest level you can in the world, which is the NBA, it should get a little bit more challenging. And on that topic of what WNBA players are saying, it's clear that they're not being treated with the same level of respect that other players from other leagues are. And there's some merit to this. I'm gonna read this excerpt of an article and tell me if that's not one of the most ridiculous things you've heard. On August 3rd, 2018, the Las Vegas Aces had to forfeit a game after a series of canceled flights left them stranded on the road for more than 25 hours and got them to Washington, D.C. just a few hours before their scheduled tip-off against the Mystics. Like all WNBA teams, the Aces fly commercial. Despite the fact that this contest had an impact on the Aces' playoff chances, the forfeit dropped them two and a half games out of the last playoff spot. All the league did was offer to move the game back an hour and briefly give the team permission to search for a charter flight. Because although nobody's arguing that the WNBA that's already losing a lot of money needs to be jetted around like really profitable leagues, ah, yo, if they have multiple canceled flights, the least you could do is get them a jet for this one instance. And so in the same tone, WNBA players are saying they need to be treated with professionalism and respect, and that's nothing that nobody can argue. They do. So I don't think it's crazy what Shaq suggested. I just don't feel as though that's the best way to attack the problem. And I'll say, luckily for the WNBA, a lot of the NBA players take it upon themselves without any obligation to actively promote the WNBA. It's almost like a brother and a sisterhood. It's like a family when you're a part of that umbrella and each one tries and supports the other. This is an example of Andre Iguodala doing just that. Number 23 from the Mystics is nice. The Washington Mystics page replied, sure is with a clip of her putting up buckets. So then ex explain to me for some reason why the number 23 in question quote tweeted Andre's tweet after the game saying, put some respect on my name or keep this tweet to yourself. I don't think anyone in their right mind saw what Andre Iguodala tweeted right there and thought that was malicious, but she interpreted it as malicious. Even though her own team page didn't, they were, they were positive about it. Any promo is good promo, especially when it's coming from relevant NBA players. And some clown on SB Nation drops the article titled number 28 from the heat was pretty disrespectful to Ariel Powers. That was disrespectful? But it really doesn't stop there neither. And I had to pull it up because I remember seeing this example in a Birdman video, but this is an example of an NFL player giving props to another NFL player just using their number. Number nine, I like how you play football, my guy. Kenneth said, appreciate that, bro. Cause there's no reason to be hostile if there's no reason to be hostile. I mean, here's a clip of Damian Lillard, just for no reason, not being asked at all, just showing support to his sisters in the WNBA. I mean, it was exciting, man. It was a, a great game. Oh, man. I mean, they was out there hooping, like, you know, just like NBA players do, the same passion, the same pace, the same grit, you know? So, you know, they, they professionals, man, and it's, it's awesome to be able to see those, those women out there competing the way they do. Um, they deserve a lot more respect, you know, and they deserve to, to make a lot more money than they do. And I think it's time for people to start recognizing that they, you know, they're professional athletes and they should be treated like it and their league should be elevated and treated that way as well. So then I don't understand why some WNBA players feel it necessary that when they do feel disrespected, they redirect that disrespect at players in the NBA showing them support. This is a tweet from a player called A. Ja Wilson. Hopefully I said that right. 154 million, must be nice. We over here looking for an M, but Lord, let me get back in my lane. Because it's fine to feel undervalued. Often people do, and you should honestly direct that towards the entity you feel like is causing that disrespect or that undervalue. But LeBron is not that person. And, and the support is not one or two players. It's almost all the superstars in the NBA showing support. A number of NBA stars, including LeBron, Chris Paul, Dane, PJ Tucker, Victor Oladipo, Devin Booker, CJ McCollum, and more wore the orange hoodie to promote the start of the WNBA season. Brooklyn Nets star, Kyrie Irving just made a huge announcement in support of WNBA players, committing 1.5 million to help cover the salaries of WNBA players who chose to sit out this year no matter what their reasons. So it's like when you see stories like this, it's so inspiring because yes, I believe the WNBA has a chance to be a very, very profitable league. We've seen it before, bro. So let's talk about real value to businesses. And I wanna give an example because it is probably one of the most atrocious examples of exploitation and nobody views it as such because this person is a millionaire and that's Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry has been in the NBA for a while. In the beginning parts of his career, he got injured a lot. And so a lot of people were pessimistic that he would have a healthy enough part of his career to get to the levels that a lot of people believed he could get to but he did. And from the 2013 season to the 2017 season, Stephen Curry was being paid on average $11 million per year. You can look at that and go, 
Wow, Stephen Curry was underpaid for an NBA athlete given all that he was doing in those years. I mean, on this year, he was all NBA second team. Next year, he was MVP. Year after that, MVP, all second team. He was a superstar making $11 million per year. But when you see this next number, it's gonna blow your mind. The value of the Golden State Warriors franchise in that same period from 2013 to 2017 went from 555 million to 2.6 billion. And it was largely done by Stephen Curry. Yeah, did KD eventually join? Did Klay Thompson play a role? Draymond, yes. Who was the star though? Stephen Curry. Who started the three-peat? Stephen Curry. He got paid $11 million per year while the owner of that same business was making billions. And that continued to traject upwards and higher and higher. And even though Stephen Curry is now being paid $40 million a year, which the average person could look at and say is overpaid, the market is telling you that Stephen Curry is building way more value than he's being able to extract for himself. So if Stephen Curry came to me and said, I deserve to be paid more. I could look at the numbers and go, yeah, you probably do. In the same time span, Stephen Curry took the Golden State Warriors from a franchise that had some exciting moments to one of the most electrifying franchise dynasties in NBA history. He took this very average franchise and made history. And that's just talking about valuation. That's not even the hundreds of millions he brought in revenue from gate sales and merchandise and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so since we're talking about it, let's get to the comparisons with the NBA. For some reason, like this is the portion that everybody is really, really obsessed with. Everyone is like, oh my God, let's compare the WNBA to the NBA, which is such a crazy comparison to make, by the way. But Forbes was comparing the collective bargaining agreement in the NBA to the WNBA. They had this to say. Currently, the NBA pays about 50% of its revenue to its players. The WNBA, as I previously calculated, and also noted by the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, ESPN, the Minnesota Star Tribune, and the Washington Post, pays less than 25% of its revenue to its players. The players of the WNBA, as AJ Wilson specifically noted, will like this revenue split to be changed. The reason that the NBA athletes can ask for more, and by the way, 50, it used to be 60, I believe, at 2010. So the NBA players have lost some of that. From, I, I could be wrong, this is just based off memory, but I think it, it at the beginning it was 60 at 2010, and then as the CBA went on for the next 10 years, they, were, they got less, less, less until it got to 50%. But that's besides the point. When you add value, you can, you have leverage to demand things. Okay, let's say that I wanna go to a network television, let's say Discovery Channel, and I wanna drop an Agent Beamstar documentary on Discovery Channel. I'm gonna go to them and I'm gonna ask for things like creative control and good revenue splits and et cetera, et cetera, ownership, you name it. But because I haven't proved that I can shoot and successfully promote a show like that, they have all of the leverage. They can basically say whatever they want to and I can come back and I might be able to get some of the stuff that I want, but they're largely gonna win those negotiations because again, I haven't proved nothing. But let's say one, two, three seasons goes by and now it's time to renegotiate. It's a successful documentary on Discovery Channel. I have a lot more leverage. Point I'm trying to make, and the point you guys already connected is WNBA players, you need leverage before you can just demand a higher revenue split. The reason why the NBA fights so hard is because one, the owners are ruthless, right? They're gonna fight regardless. And so, I mean, I was a sport management major in university, so I, f I had to learn about the whole history of the MLB and how the MLB Players Association fought tirelessly and actually paved the way for all other players associations to demand what they want out of their league. And they've been getting it. The MLB is an example of, wow, they've just been winning forever. There's no hard caps, players. There's no cap on how much you can play a, a baseball player in the MLB. That being said, leverage. It's fine if you believe that you're underpaid. And it's even fine to argue for more than 25% of your revenue if you feel like you deserve it. Argue the points when you get to the table and you guys are agreeing on a new collective bargaining agreement. But what I feel like shouldn't happen from WNBA players is you taking the shots at the same athletes that are showing you support. Because I don't know what that's like, but I can't imagine that I'm supporting someone publicly all the time. And then in response, I'm the one getting criticized from those same people, even though me as a person, I'm LeBron James, I have proved that I can make this league a ton of money and way more value than I've been able to get from it. That being said, it's also true that 
LeBron James makes way more money off the court than he does on the court. His lifetime shoe deals and his Space Jam 2 movie deals and all the other side businesses that he's building make him way more money than the money he gets on the court. And WNBA players know that because the top WNBA athletes make more money off the court than they do on the court as well. Okay, so we've discussed all the problems and we've got really in depth about it. Now, how do we fix it? This is part of the video where I tell you, I largely don't know. Just based on my own experience watching leagues of all kinds, I don't think the appeal of the WNBA is high level talent. Because if I wanna watch high level talent, I'm watching the NBA first. And then I might watch the Euro League and then the Chinese League and Turkish League. And I'm watching a lot of leagues before if my main priority is just skill level, right? Not to say the WNBA athletes aren't great, but if we're talking about appeal, guys in the Chinese League are just a lot more athletic. And I feel like instead of tiptoeing around it the way that Shaq has to do on national television, it'd be better for the league and the players if we just admitted that there's fundamental differences between the men in the NBA and the women in the WNBA. And instead of pretending like they don't exist, we could acknowledge that they exist and then talk about how we can make the appeal of the WNBA better because women have their strengths too. And although I don't agree that lowering the net is the best way to do it, because I don't think it's a lack of dunks that's making the WNBA lack profitability. I feel like that's not the main reason. And as I look onto different sports, you see examples, especially in tennis, of Serena Williams, who's seen a ton of success. Her popularity rivals some of the most popular people on planet Earth, and she's a woman playing tennis. And this is an interesting clip I saw from Serena Williams herself because when I talk about topics that like I don't have personal experience in, I like to draw from the experiences of people that have actually done those things. And in an interview with David Letterman, she said this. For me, tennis and men's tennis and women's tennis are completely almost two separate sports. So I'm like, if I were to play Andy Murray, I would lose 6-0, 6-0 in five to six minutes, maybe 10 minutes, because it's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster. They serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game. Okay, so did you guys feel the awkward tension in the air when she said those things? And she is a woman. Women. God damn it, agent, you don't know English class? She is a woman saying it. But everyone in the audience is like, uh, are we gonna talk about this thing that we're supposed to pretend like isn't a thing? And it's like, why are we doing that? Who does that benefit? And Serena's sitting here thinking to herself like, that doesn't benefit me that all you guys are awkward, so who does this benefit? And Serena's more popular than goddamn every male tennis player on planet Earth. I might be speaking out of line here because I don't watch much tennis, but at least to me, I just hear way more about Serena, bro, than I do about any Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, bro, I promise you. But still, there's great appeal to sit there and watch Serena play tennis, even though she's sitting there admitting, telling you that she's not the highest level because the men is just completely dipped different sports. So I don't think the answer is to, to make the WNBA the highest level of com competitive. I think the objective should be to get the best women in the world in the WNBA, always. Personally to me, I think the WNBA should aggressively, and I mean aggressively, try and create superstars in the league. You need a face, someone that's exciting to watch. I And it doesn't have to be by dunks. It could be from dribble moves. It could be a post hook. There was players in the NBA like Kareem known for the post hook. Players in the, known for the post moves. There could be players in the WNBA known for being on the bench like JaVale McGee was for the NBA. I think the WNBA needs to be aggressively trying to create those stars. And by stars, I don't mean best players because that's gonna be a star, yes. But when you think about leagues like the NBA, there's the quiet guy like Kawhi Leonard. There's the freakishly athletic guy like Giannis Antetokounmpo. There's the wildly impressive player like Kobe Bryant. There's the incredibly freakishly tall player like Boban Marjanovic. So the NBA has a bunch of different players of all different skill levels within the NBA that are known for different things. And so when I tune into a game and I'm watching LaMelo play, it's because he's passing the ball like this every two seconds and it's exciting to watch. I'm watching Hornets games this year, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Not because the Hornets are the number one team in the league, but because they have a player that I've been watching since Ball is Life clips in high school. So you need to identify who you believe can be those stars and you decide on some metrics that can help you get to those conclusions and then you need to push to create them into those stars. And the reality is a lot of the times you're gonna be wrong. The NBA has been wrong a lot in identifying stars, but that's not the point. The point is to just keep shooting. Eventually there's gonna be a face, a very large face in the WNBA. And whether or not you watch the WNBA, you'll know that face. And when her games come on, you'll watch her. And just by watching her, you're gonna increasingly get more and more included into the WNBA world 
until eventually WNBA starts to see viewership that the NBA is seeing. The WNBA is a largely like fresh league in, in relative to most major league standards in North America. So they're not in a particular rush to get everything right immediately. But that being said, losing money year on year is a problem. And at some point the league has to be profitable. In my personal opinion, I don't think lowering the net is a solution. I think aggressively looking for more stars is. Well, that's my take on it, ladies and gentlemen. I feel like we shouldn't need to tiptoe around it. I feel like if people were more open about it the way Serena and plenty of other athletes are, then it'd be better for athletes all around the world. And until then, uh, hopefully I don't see too many comments about why is this fat slob commenting about athletes? as if you had to be an athlete to comment on athletes. Well, I'm a content creator. If you're not a content creator, don't comment about my content creating. All right, guys, I made my point. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>